Would you describe the breadth of robotic studies in AI research at UT Austin? So robotics at, at UT Austin is actually, and actually everywhere, is a pretty broad field. So you don't just find robotics in computer science. There's, um, there's faculty in multiple departments working on things from all the way from designing the motors and the sort of low level electronics up to the high level intelligent control. And so at UT Austin, I'm the director of Texas Robotics, where we have faculty, core faculty across four different departments, computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and aerospace engineering. And really, we like to think of ourselves as covering the full breadth of robotics, all the way from the motors to the, to the decisions. Um, we also go very deeply in uh, a couple of areas. The, the, um, the areas where we really try to be world leaders are in long-term autonomy, trying to get robots that you can turn on and that can stay autonomous without any human intervention for long periods of time. And somewhat related to that, uh, human-robot interaction. If these robots are going to be on for long periods of time, they need to be able to interact with people. Um, and human-robot interaction, we take a very broad definition of that, including um, rehabilitative robotics, assistive sort of robots that can be used for, for therapy. Going uh, within AI, which is uh, very connected to, to robotics, we're similarly very broad here at, at UT Austin. We have faculty working in computer vision and natural language processing and machine learning theory um, and planning. So, uh, so really the, the, um, the, the fields themselves of AI and robotics are very broad and we have very broad coverage here at the university. Why did you choose to study robotics and AI? So my first entry into artificial intelligence was actually when I was a high school student. Um, I went to a, a sort of a, a career fair kind of thing at the University of Buffalo where I grew up. And um, we got sort of introduced to various different fields. And there was a, a professor there, a faculty member, who, who was um, studying artificial intelligence. And, he pointed out to us that, that some things that, that are very, very easy for people um, are very difficult for computers. At the time, even writing a program that could tell the difference between a circle and a square if you show it an image was a difficult thing to do. Now, of course, we're, we're able to do that. But there's still many things that people can do that computers cannot. And, and so my entry into artificial intelligence was, was really being excited about it as one of the major frontiers of knowledge of our of our time. In fact, some people say some of the, the biggest questions of our time are what's the origin of the universe, what's the origin of life, and then what's the nature of intelligence. And artificial intelligence is one way of getting at this question of what's the nature of intelligence. There's actually multiple different ways of doing it. Um, there's, there's different fields. Some people study the, the brain itself, uh, which is one of our um, best examples of intelligence. So neuroscientists and psychologists study human brains to try to understand the nature of intelligence. There's also philosophical approaches, but I got very, uh, very enthralled by the notion of, of computer science being able to focus on trying to create intelligent artifacts and use that as a way of understanding what intelligence is all about. And so that's what we do in, in artificial intelligence. And, um, and for me, robotics is, just sort of a part of that whole endeavor, trying to understand intelligence. I think one of the, one of the hallmarks of, um, of human intelligence is that our brains are not in isolation. Our brains are part of a body. Um, so we call this embodied intelligence. And I think that's important for studying the nature of intelligence itself, being able to, um, to understand what, what it means to have a decision-making entity inside a, a body, it could be a robot, um, that has to interact with the real world and all of the uncertainty and unpredictability that, that comes with it. So, so, um, so for me, that's, that's really what robotics is about. I come really primarily from this, this starting point of artificial intelligence, and then robotics is, is a way of, of, um, of studying AI. What is the future of robotics and AI? So, um, of course, you know, we're always trying to, to predict the future. Um, and uh, you know, one of our jobs as researchers, as faculty, is to try to create the future, to try to, to do things that, that wouldn't otherwise be done. Um, of course, in artificial intelligence, it's such a fast moving field that it's, that it's very difficult to predict what's, what's going to happen. Um, 
one thing to note historically is that there's been, it's been a field that sort of had some very big ups and downs. There's times in, in the past 70 years when people have been incredibly uh, optimistic and enthusiastic about the possibility of artificial intelligence. And we're sort of in one of those times right now. There's been other times, we sometimes call them the AI winter, where people say, oh, hey, there was such big expectations for artificial intelligence and they failed to deliver. And so we now know it's a failure. And, you know, it's, um, it's not unlikely that that'll happen again, um, that there'll be these sort of, uh, you know, a period of, of where people become more disillusioned with, uh, with artificial intelligence and the claims that, that, um, that people make and the promises. Um, but as a field, from where I sit, it's actually been much very much like many scientific endeavors, that there's been steady progress, there's been incremental advances, there's been a lot of hard work by a lot of, a lot of people, and um, you know, people are striving towards different goals. And uh, so part of my style of, of research is to try to set ambitious goals and do what we can to try to, to achieve them. Um, the field's been working towards autonomous driving in a very public way. One of the grand challenges that I work on is, um, is the Robot Soccer Challenge or RoboCup. I'm right now president of the International RoboCup Federation. And our goal is by the year 2050 to build a team of humanoid robots that can beat the best World Cup soccer team on a real soccer field. And so, you know, we're not close to being able to do that yet um, as, a, as a field, but this is the kind of challenge that, that, uh, you know, that I hope we'll be able to achieve in the, in the coming years. Would you introduce the video that we're about to watch? So I'm now pleased to share with you a, a video about some of the research that's, that's going on in my lab. And in fact, this video was not produced specifically for this, uh, for high school students. In fact, it was developed for a professional conference, for a workshop um, at the, the main robotics conference, ICRA, the International Conference on Robotics and Automation, um, in a workshop on interactive robot learning. And, um, and so as such, it's actually a window for you. I thought that would be, might be interesting to share um, the kinds of things and the kinds of ways we share information with our, with our colleagues. Um, I think it should be mostly understandable, but don't, don't worry if there's some terms or concepts that you're, you're not familiar with. Um, the, the background is that you know, it's, we'd really like our robots to be able to learn to improve their performance, not to always have to, to program them. But learning from trial and error only could be, uh, you know, is, is not likely to be, um, to be effective. It could take a very long time, uh, for one thing, and it can also be dangerous. We don't want an autonomous car to learn how to stay on the road by first crashing into trees and falling off of cliffs. Um, so the, the way that, one of the common ways to counter that is to, enable robots and programs to learn from demonstrations, from examples of good behaviors. And so that's the interactive part of it. Um, there's, the video you're gonna see is, is uh, on joint work between myself, um, Dr. Garrett Warnell, who's the one giving the, giving the talk, who you'll see. He's a, uh, a researcher at Army Research Lab and a close collaborator of mine. He has an office here at UT Austin. And then also some of the students that he and I co-advise, and you'll see them mentioned as well. These are graduate students. So you can think of this as the kind of thing you might do if you go on major in computer science. You might have some opportunities to, to do research uh, as an undergraduate, but then especially if you go on to, to graduate school in artificial intelligence. And there's sort of two contributions, two parts to the, to the video. Um, one starts from the, the notion that there are robots that already have ways of navigating, um, hand-programmed kinds of ways, but those programs have parameters and trying to figure out what are the best parameters can be very difficult. And so we have come up with a new way of having a person um, teleoperate the robot, remote control it, and use the, then allow the robot to try to figure out for itself what the parameters of the navigation program should be. And then the second, and you'll see there's some videos on real robots of that that were done just a few months ago. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, a second part that's, that's learning from imitation from observation. The idea of trying to learn, and this is mostly done in simulation in our work so far, but it also should apply to, to real robots. Um, be able to learn from examples where you don't get to see what actions were actually taken, but you only just see the, um, the sequence of states that the demonstration went through. That'll be explained in the, in the video and hopefully will become clear. So. I hope you enjoy. 
Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Garrett Mornell. Uh, I work with uh, Peter Stone at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm also a research scientist for the Army Research Laboratory. Um, we're very pleased to have been uh, given, invited to give a talk at uh, this workshop on interactive robot learning, and uh, we're excited to, to share with you some of our, some of our recent work. Okay, so I wanna start by talking about uh, some things that are going on in machine learning right now. Particularly, there's been a lot of excitement that surrounds learning behaviors from scratch. And we've seen successes in games, games like domains. So, I mean like Atari video games or board games like Backgammon uh, and Go. And very recently, we've actually seen success in uh, real-time strategy games like StarCraft II or Dota II. And so this is very exciting. You, you're, you sort of set up your machine learning algorithm, you give it very little prior information, and you let it learn from experience how to be successful in these domains. So uh, as roboticists, one question we have is maybe will, will these successes that we've seen in these uh, games domains, will they translate to robotics? Will they enable robots to play soccer better? Will they enable sort of robot arms to collaborate more effectively with, with uh, humans on manufacturing tasks, let's say? And uh, for like a general ground navigating vehicle, will, will they uh, you know, produce better navigation behaviors? Can we expect things that we've seen in games to translate into robotics? So if we look a little more closely at the literature for the successes in the games domains, uh, we sort of see that maybe there's a uh, reason to be concerned. So for some, some recent results uh, in Atari, we see that you know, in order to train these algorithms to uh, achieve very good performance, they need to process 200 million frames of data corresponding to 10 days of experience time. Uh, in the board games domains uh, for AlphaGo, we saw that uh, for some recent work where they tried to reproduce AlphaGo, they needed 2000 GPUs and two weeks of compute time in order to uh, achieve the same performance as was originally reported. And in the uh, real-time strategy games, even if we have two weeks and very specialized hardware, uh, we need to amass 200 years of real-time play in order to learn how to play StarCraft. So if we're thinking about whether or not these, uh, these algorithms will translate well to robotics where we have constraints such as we must operate in real time, we need to maybe manually reset some of the, the robots for episodic tasks, and we get wear and tear on our robots, joints may overheat, ball bearings may fail, right? It seems that you know, maybe these, these approaches for learning behaviors from scratch probably won't translate to robotics. But I don't think all hope is lost. Um, I think maybe we can uh, take a slightly different approach and we can learn behaviors from other agents, not necessarily just from scratch. And so uh, the hypothesis we've been pursuing recently at the University of Texas at Austin uh, is that robots will be able to quickly acquire effective behaviors uh, by learning from or interacting with other agents. And by that I mean uh, maybe other trained agents or even, even humans, other intelligent agents. So we have reason to believe that this might work. Um, in the video games domains where we saw all the successes in learning from scratch, we also see successes in uh, learning from other agents. So this is some recent work, deep Q learning from demonstrations, where it was shown that if you can uh, uh, acquire demonstration information for, for playing some of these Atari games, you can do even better than learning from scratch. So that's, that's a really nice result that, that gives us some hope. Um, I think what gives us even more hope is really that the most autonomous agents we have right now, mainly humans, the most successful ones, they don't learn from scratch at all. In fact, um, humans learn from other agents such as parents, they learn from uh, educational instructors, maybe at a university, and for even specialized tasks, uh, they learn from coaches, maybe if, if you're learning to play soccer, there's someone very, very uh, specialized there who is already knows how to play the game and can give you very specific uh, instructions and help you learn. So in this talk, um, I'm going to focus on learning from demonstration as a means of interagent uh, interaction and learning. And in particular, I'm going to talk about two recent uh, efforts that we've, that we've had at, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, the first is a hierarchical approach to learning from demonstration that has enabled more robust robot navigation. And this is kind of hot off the presses. Um, what we're doing here is we're using teleoperation data of a robot navigating this the small ground robot. And we're going to use that teleoperation data, which was provided by a human, to make the navigation behavior exhibited by this robot more robust. 
In the second part of the talk, I'll talk about a recent observational extension of the learning from demonstration paradigm that allows us to uh, do learning from demonstration even when we don't have uh, sort of hard to acquire demonstration data. You know, maybe you can't collect teleoperations or kinesthetic demonstrations of a behavior. And instead, we'd really like to enable uh, learning new behaviors from just video observations um, that are sort of freely available online. So uh, I'll, I'll dive now into the first part of the talk, which is on uh, learning from demonstration for robot navigation. Uh, this is joint work that's led uh, by uh, Shui Su Xiao and Bo Lu uh, in the Learning Agents Research Group at the University of Texas, and also with my colleague, Jonathan Fink at the University of Austin, or at the uh, Army Research Laboratory. So our motivation here is that deploying an autonomous navigation system for a new environment is not always as straightforward as it may seem. So uh, I'll try to illustrate this by example. So let's say someone sends you a robot, maybe your friend, they send you a robot to, uh, to use, then this robot can autonomously navigate. But they've tuned it for some outdoor environment, maybe, maybe it's got buildings, maybe it's urban, they've tuned that navigation system so that the robot can navigate autonomously in that environment. But they've sent it to you, and you'd like to use it in maybe an office building. This is a picture of uh, the computer science building at the University of Texas. And so, I think what you'll find is if you are given such a robot that's tuned for one environment and you try to deploy it in uh, another environment and you try to supply waypoints to the robot and you expect it to navigate to these waypoints autonomously, you'll find that it doesn't work. Um, but that's okay, everyone sort of understands this if you've been working in robot navigation and, and there's, a, there's actually a guide out there. So if you're using ROS as many of us do um, and you're using sort of the vanilla move base uh, architecture for uh, doing autonomous navigation, um, there's actually this very nice document called the Ross Navigation Tuning Guide. So not to worry, let's just consult this guide and, and we can get our robot to navigate. But if we look closely at the abstract there, we'll see some, some interesting statements. So uh, they say maximizing the performance of this navigation stack requires some fine tuning of parameters. And this is not as simple as it looks. One who is sophomoric about the concepts and reasoning may try things randomly and waste a lot of time. So that sounds pretty intimidating, especially if you're not uh, a roboticist, uh, if, if you just want to use the robot, if you don't have the training uh, to understand the thing. I mean, you may be someone who has invented uh, an autonomous navigation algorithm, but even if you are, and even if you would understand what's in this document, uh, we'll also notice that you will have 23 pages of instructions to sift through. So it's not accessible, the, 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 the tuning procedure we have right now, it's not accessible to people who, who aren't roboticists. And even if we are roboticists, we may find it very frustrating uh, in order to uh, go work through this guide and get our robot to navigate. So we're inspired uh, in this work that we can do better. And particularly we're inspired by the fact that humans can do this effortlessly. So this is one of our collaborators, Bo, who, who was one of the lead authors on this work. And uh, Bo can grab an Xbox controller and uh, teleoperate the robot around uh, an environment that might be challenging for an untuned navigation system. He can do this effortlessly basically on his first try. And so these are the type of demonstrations that we will be collecting in this work. And uh, I'm gonna describe to you sort of our, our approach for uh, trying to uh, tune the navigation stack uh, based on these demonstrations. So the central question we have is, can we squeeze more robust performance out of our existing navigation systems using learning from demonstration and limited human interaction. So that, that human interaction I'm talking about here, it's a demonstration. Um, and we are uh, particularly concerned with doing this for existing navigation systems. So we're not really interested in inventing an entirely new navigation system. We're instead sort of interested, interested in um, augmenting our existing systems with a machine learning component. So as an example of such a, such a navigation system, let's just take this ROS move base navigation stack. This is sort of, the vanilla autonomous navigation system that you might use if uh, someone said, hey, get this robot navigating autonomously by tomorrow. Um, and what we're interested in doing is not changing this navigation stack. We'd still like to use it, but we'd like to insert a new component uh, that sort of interacts with this navigation stack and a component that we would train from learning from demonstration. So the question is, can we devise such a component and, and can it lead to better performance out of the navigation system overall? So of course, um, using learning from demonstration in robotics is not a new task. And even uh, using it to uh, help improve robot navigation is not a new task. Of course, there's a rich body of literature in general 
Um, you can go see the survey by Brenna Argall and her collaborators from several years ago if you're, if you're interested in that kind of work. With respect to navigation in particular, we've seen approaches even very recently that sort of approach the problem in an end-to-end -end fashion where we're trying to map uh, sensor data directly to, to motor commands uh, with sort of short circuits, uh, existing navigation systems that are out there today. Um, we've also seen approaches that sort of try to approach this problem by um, sp picking out specific components of autonomous navigation and applying machine learning there. There's some work that uh, where uh, inverse reinforcement learning was used to, to process some demonstrations and try to learn better cost maps for navigation. And um, even, even in, the, in the realm of sort of using a system and, and wrapping machine learning around it, we have seen some approaches that have a similar flavor to what we're gonna present, but they're, they're specific to a certain navigation system. Whereas the approach that I'm gonna talk about here, we're, we're sort of agnostic to whatever navigation system you have running on your robot. So what we propose to do here is use behavioral cloning to tune any navigation stack. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, let's pretend your navigation system is described by some function G, which processes sensor data and outputs motor commands. And there's this other parameter for G, which is theta, which uh, we will call the tuning parameters. And these aren't parameters like in the neural net sense of parameters. They're not like weights for linear functions and things like that. They're, they're rather sort of the hyper parameters of whatever navigation stack you have. So for a very common uh, navigation system uh, called DWA that we use um, in, in our system for one of our experiments, these parameters are things like how many samples should we take uh, in each component of the motor command, dimensions, um, what's the maximum velocity will allow for the, for the robot. So these are sort of uh, parameters that are hard to, to sort of um, put real nice equations behind, but they are very important for the, the performance of the system. And like I said, we're going to use behavioral cloning to learn parameters, learn these data, this data from a demonstration using supervised learning. And so just briefly, like this is, what, this is sort of the, the classic supervised learning problem. We're going to seek some theta star that minimizes uh, a cost function that's typical for supervised learning where we would like to minimize the distance between sort of uh, XI UI, which the demonstrator showed us for some demonstration state, the demonstrator requested some motor commands U, and we would like our function G with whatever theta we're using to uh, produce very similar motor commands to what the demonstrator showed us. So the rough procedure I'm describing is this. First, collect a demonstration. So grab your robot, turn it on, grab your Xbox controller, and drive the robot around. And while you're doing that, record the sensor data that the robot is perceiving, and then also record the motor commands that the human demonstrator asked for via the uh, controller. And call that some data set D, which consists of these XU pairs. And then use a black box optimization algorithm to solve for the navigation stack parameters. So uh, in our work, we use the CMAES uh, black box navigation, or, or black box uh, optimization system, but in general, you could use uh, any, any black box optimization algorithm that you'd like. You, you provide the data set, the XU pairs, you provide access to G, you don't really understand, you, could, you can't get maybe a, get a derivative uh, with respect to G, but you can, you can definitely query it with samples. And then after running this procedure for some time, what, what comes out to you is sort of the best data in the sense that I described before in the behavioral cloning sense. Okay, this procedure is fine, but there's actually a, a problem with it. Um, the problem is that humans actually exhibit very different navigation behaviors in different environments. And so, whereas before we were thinking we could get away with just learning a single theta star, when we're faced with environments that, are, that, that exhibit a lot of differences, such as uh, the, the, pic the environment I'm showing here, where we have maybe four different kinds of environments, the first being, you know, we called it the curve environment, the second, the obstacle course environment in green, in yellow, sort of a corridor, a, a, a curving corridor, and then uh, in red, sort of open space. Um, each of these is sort of qualitatively different, and what we notice is that humans actually drive differently based on where the robot is. And so we can't achieve what we'd like to achieve with just learning a single theta, a single theta star because of this. Uh, instead, what we'd like to do is learn a separate theta star for each of those uh, different environments. So we the proposed the 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 uh, approach we propose, we call it Apple D. It stands for Adaptive Planner Parameter Learning from Demonstration. And if we start from the previous steps that I showed before, we will still be collecting a demonstration. We will still be using a black box uh, optimization algorithm in the same way that I proposed. But after we collect the demonstration, uh, what we'll do is we'll perform automatic demonstration segmentation. And this is where we try to automatically discover uh, using a change point detection algorithm. We used uh, one called CHAMP in our work. 
um, where are those qualitatively different environments in the demonstration, and then segment the demonstration based on those change points. And then uh, use the black box optimization scheme I described before, but now do it per segment that you found in step two. And then finally, so, so that we know what, what theta to use at deployment, we also uh, will we introduce a context predictor, which is a supervised learning um, procedure that we use to map the sensor data to the context. So once we, have the, once we know what context we're in based on the sensor data, then we can go grab the correct data star uh, for, for the context we've predicted. So when we go to deploy the system, we, we still use the same move based stack that we, uh, or that we had before. Of course, you could use any other stack as long as it can be queried by a black box optimization algorithm. And we insert into that the component that I was describing at the beginning of this section, where we pass in real time, we read the sensor data X, we predict the context using this function B. And then the function M here will just map the predicted context to the theta star that we learned. Uh, using black box optimization. And we do all this in real time. So X will be read uh, you know, at some frequency and new thetas will be supplied to the navigation stack while the robot is navigating. And that's what allows us to detect context on the fly and retune the navigation stack on the fly. So we did some experiments. Um, what we used was a robot. We used a clear path jackal and the sensor input was LIDAR returns from a Velodyne puck LIDAR. Of course, we had our human demonstrator who was our, our uh, one of the lead authors here, Bo. And he had uh, an Xbox wireless controller and supplied uh, demonstrations of the robot navigating in the way that he would do it. And then, of course, we constructed a challenging sort of obstacle course environment with these qualitatively different um, sections to it so that we could uh, investigate the efficacy of, of Appleby. So uh, what I'll show now is a video um, of just how the vanilla move base performs without any Apple D augmentation using the parameters, the navigation stack parameters that, that ClearPath, the robot manufacturer, uh, suggests that you use. And so this is, the, this is the robot trying to navigate this curved corridor. And it's not streaming issues that is causing the video to freeze. It's actually the robot slowing down, stopping, trying to recompute. And you can see when it fails, it, it fails to find a navigation uh, solution and it enters a recovery behavior, which here is to just back up a little bit blindly. And so every time it does that, of course, we, we grab the controller and try to move the robot into a better position in order to not have it knock over our, our cardboard walls. But you can see the, the vanilla uh, navigation system is not doing very well in this environment. And this is exactly the problem I was describing before, which is that um, if you don't have a nicely tuned navigation stack, then navigation, autonomous navigation is not going to go great for you. So here's uh, you know, a little bit longer version of the demonstration collection that we had. So Bo grabbed the controller and uh, he teleoperated the robot around the environment while we were recording uh, the sensor measurements and the, uh, the requested actions. And of course, you can see that he has none of the problems that the robot was having. I mean, I know you can only see the antenna of the robot right now, but obviously Bo is able to very quickly and easily drive the robot through the corridor. And then you can see also when he hits the open space, he speeds up the robot to try to get all the way across the space as fast as possible, which is another qualitative shift um, in the human's behavior. So uh, what I'll show you now is sort of how uh, Apple D worked in this environment at deployment time. Um, we have the same uh, context that I described before. We went through the, the procedure that I described. We segmented the demonstration. We did the behavioral cloning black box optimization procedure for each of those uh, contexts. And we learned a theta star for each of those contexts. And then we, we also had a context predictor that we used at deployment. What you'll see in the video is the top half is going to be the vanilla move base uh, algorithm that um, running that I showed uh, a few slides ago. And then on the bottom is going to be the, the system that's running using our, approach, our proposed approach, Apple D. So you can see the robot has a lot of problems with the, the first context when in, in the vanilla move base type of uh, framework, but powers right through it using the tuned uh, parameters from, from Apple D, makes it through the obstacle course, no problem, sort of in both cases. Of course, when we get to the, the corridor, this is what we saw before, and you can see now that the system is detecting a new context, applying a new set of parameters uh, to the navigation stack that enables the robot to slowly but successfully navigate through this corridor in a similar way to uh, what Bo showed it to do. And then you'll see right here, it hits the open space, detects the open space context, and raises the maximum velocity uh, for, the, for the navigation stack and uh, navigates in a very similar way to the, the human demonstrator. So uh, just some numbers uh, to go with these plots. So what we've done here is we've segmented each of the contexts individually to look at them 
uh, separately. So you know, A is the, e, e, there's four different rows here and each one corresponds to a different context. And it's not really important to analyze every, every single number in detail, but what you will see is that um, in terms of real world time to make it through that part of the environment, the Apple D approach uh, does it the fastest, which, you know, there's no failures and it's actually moving very quickly. And one thing that's really interesting to note is that once we've tuned it, we actually get the power that you would expect out of an autonomous system, uh, like a computer driven system, which is that it actually navigates these uh, environments faster than the human demonstrator could. So we, we found that very, very interesting that, you know, once you tune the, 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 the navigation stack, it can actually do better than the human when you go to deploy it. Uh, finally, we'll show a little bit of generalization. Um, what we did was we reconstructed the environment. We tried to shift the, we have the same qualitative uh, types of environments here, but we reconstructed them and tried to shift them around the gym a little bit. Of course, you know, we're not going to get it perfect. We, you know, we're setting up these cardboard boxes and there's going to be small errors in sort of what we did. The obstacle course isn't exactly laid out the same, but we're still interested in knowing if the training from the first uh, demonstration would uh, lead to good deployment in this environment as well. And so I'll just show you a little clip here. So here, you know, it has again detected that this is the, the uh, curving corridor context and then exhibits the behavior that we saw before in the training environment. And then actually it's gonna hit the obstacle course here. And this obstacle course is much harder because um, it sort of has to bend around and do a little bit of slaloming as it goes. And uh, it actually goes, uh, Apple D leads to navigation behaviors that are quite a bit faster than uh, the demonstrator gave for that for that context originally. And then of course, in the open space, it acts like before. So we have evidence to believe that it generalizes at least a little bit. And then if you can keep providing it demonstrations, it will generalize more and more um, as it sees more and more context. Now, remember, we also wanted to make sure that this was gonna be an approach that could work for any robot with whatever navigation stack you have. Um, this, this Apple D uh, framework that we're describing would, would help you tune your whatever robot you have. And so we also have some other robots at UT. Uh, we have these BWI robots, which are on Segway bases, and they, they also run the move base stack, but they use a different planner uh, at the local level. They use one called the, the EBAN planner as opposed to the DWA planner. So it's a, different, it's a different navigation system that actually has different parameters that are also hard to understand and tune. Um, and what you're gonna see, see in this video, of course, is on the left, uh, we would like this robot to just go down the middle of the corridor straight. Um, if you use sort of the default parameters provided by the E-band, um, the E-band designers, you'll get this oscillatory behavior you see on, in red on the left. Um, when we've tuned it as roboticists who sit with these robots every day, trying to get a better behavior, we can reduce some of that oscillatory behavior. But then on the right, we're going to see that we've actually completely eliminated it once we provided the robot a demonstration and used the Apple D framework. And so you just a brief clip showing it running on... Um, another robot using another navigation stack and also in a different environment. Okay, so uh, that sort of concludes the first part of the talk where we're talking about using learning from demonstration to help with robot navigation. I'll now move on and briefly touch upon some of our work we've done in uh, extending learning from demonstration to be able to process observational data like, like videos. So this is a uh, work that has been led by Faraz Tarabi. He's a, a member of the Learning Agents Research Group at UT. Um, and we have uh, several pub publications on the, on the topic that, that you can find. Um, what we'd like to do here, like I said, is sort of enable the behavior you're seeing on the screen where uh, a small child is watching a video and uh, there are some characters in the video that are exhibiting certain behaviors and the child just from watching uh, this video has learned to mimic the exact sequence of actions that, the, that was happening on the screen. Um, and so that's the same type of thing that we'd like our robots to be able to do, is process demonstration information of this form. So our motivation here is that control signals are not always available for learning from demonstration. So what I just talked about was great. We had an Xbox controller. We were, we were able to collect a teleoperated demonstration of robot navigation, but there's a couple of reasons maybe that this is not always going to be the case. So the first is you might have a platform which is not so advanced as that clear path jackal. Maybe you have a very old vehicle. Maybe it doesn't even have drive by wire in it. it is, it's just not equipped to record control signals. On the other hand, it's really easy now to just like slap a GoPro on the front of a vehicle and collect video data. Um, another reason might be that you have some pre-recorded demonstration data that was made for humans. Um, for instance, if you're trying to learn how to dance, I think you'd have to study this for a very long time, but um, this is something you can find on the internet and, and you can use, and it was designed for humans, and if we wanna be able to use it on robots, we need to enable this, this uh, style of imitation learning from processing just video. 
So we're inspired here um, by the fact that deep learning recently has enabled uh, pretty impressive processing of raw observational data. So if we go back to some of the video game domains that I talked about earlier in the talk, um, like Atari, where they're processing state information as the pixel information on the screen with no extra hand, hand tuning of uh, feature extraction and so on. They've, add, they've done this by um, inserting convolutional layers into a, a gigantic neural network. And uh, what we find is that actually the performance is very good once you do this. This enables you to process this raw observational data and perform very well. So this is just uh, a figure from the Rainbow DQM paper showing that when you have a network like this, you can you know, outperform humans on these Atari games by, by quite a bit. And uh, this suggests that you know, we, we can be successful in processing this raw data using sort of convolutional neural networks and deep neural networks in general. So the central question we, we've been asking here is, can, we, can existing imitation learning techniques be extended to leverage state-only demonstrations? So whereas before in the previous part of the talk, our demonstration consisted of states and actions. In the previous part, I had X's and U's to sort of match more of the controls literature, but here it's S's and A's. They're, they're very similar. You can think of them the same way. Um, and instead of getting the action information A, instead we are not given the action information. We don't know. We just have a demonstration that comes in the form of a state-only trajectory. And uh, in this work in particular, we've been focusing a lot on sort of simulated robots of, of this kind. So this is very standard benchmark domains in the community where we have these limbed robots where we're trying to control joint torques on them to get them to perform sort of very simple behaviors. Um, and even this is very challenging. Of course, we do have uh, plans and ongoing work trying to implement what we've been doing in simulation on real robots to really show the, the power of these techniques. But the, the results I'll discuss here uh, have been proved out in, in these simulation domains. So um, there's some related work, of course, uh, on trying to do imitation learning on sort of raw state-only demonstrations. Uh, one sort of thread of work that's a little bit older is people approach this from the perception perspective, where they sort of try to handcraft ways around this processing raw state information. Maybe they design sort of uh, very complicated systems to remove video from the entire pipeline, or um, maybe they've de designed sort of very specific vision techniques to extract the better, better features to use for, for imitation learning. Um, in sort of a, if you look at it from the controls perspective, from the policy learning perspective, people have been uh, proposed several approaches like doing sort of handcrafted reward engineering to try to, to get around the, the, the problem that action information is missing or, or learning models. One of our approaches is also a model learning uh, technique and, and there is a lots of work going on uh, in, this, in this space currently. So we've, we've had sort of, uh, our contributions have sort of come in sort of two main uh, avenues. The first is uh, some work we've done called Behavioral Cloning from Observation, an Ichikai paper from a couple of years ago, where it is a very model-based approach to solving this imitation from observation problem. Um, in particular, we learn a model to infer action information from state sequences using experience gathered on the imitator before uh, learning begins. And so um, I would encourage you to go uh, read the paper if you're interested in this. I'm, I'm not going to focus on that in, in this talk today for time reasons. I'm instead going to focus on our work, uh, our adversarial imitation from observation work, where we are using, um, instead of doing a model learning approach, we're going to try to leverage the power of uh, generative adversarial networks, obviously a very hot topic in machine learning now, in order to enable uh, this imitation from observation behavior. And so broadly, we have um, you know, a discriminator that tries to uh, determine whether or not the, the demonstrated behavior is uh, coming from the imitator or the, or the, dem the demonstrator. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that now. So um, yeah, this is, this is sort of what the, the, the system diagram looks like. Uh, we have the, an imitator, that's the learner. We're trying to learn the imitation policy. And then we have a discriminator, which is trying to uh, differentiate between the imitator's behavior and the demonstrated behavior. So the demonstrator block in this diagram is the state-only transitions that you have gathered from your, this is imitation learning, so someone has demonstrated for you the behavior. And then the imitator is a policy that you're evolving. And uh, as you continue to learn, you can generate behavior with that, policy, that policy by interacting with the environment. And then that behavior and the demonstrator's behavior are both fed to a discriminator, where the discriminator's job is to try to tell uh, what agent produced which behavior. So we tell the discriminator that the demonstrator produced this state trajectory and the imitator produced this other state trajectory and now try to tell them apart, right? So the, the, 
the specific data we provide are these uh, state next state uh, sequences. These are available. Action information is not available, but state next state sequences are. And uh, we have this policy pi that we're trying to learn. That's the imitator. And the discriminator is outputting the score function v, which is uh, supposed to be large for uh, well, draw it closer to one for the demonstrator and, and push it closer to zero for the imitator. Um, like I said before, like our, our, our sort of our hope for this work is that deep neural networks will, will help us with this problem. And so, you know, we have been using deep neural networks for both the imitation policy and for the discriminator itself. And so uh, we're very interested to see how this approach would do. And again, this is sort of the, the sort of uh, graphical diagram of what's going on here, where you have on the right side what the imitator does, the, the policy pies in green, and on the left side, just what the discriminator uh, sees for the demonstrator. And you can see we try to pull the V up to one for the demonstrator's trajectories and the V down to zero for the imitator. And then importantly, the V is used, the score is used as the reward for the imitator update. So the discriminator's job is to tell the two uh, behaviors apart. The imitator's job is to then try to modify its behavior such that it can fool the discriminator. And so if you keep doing this in an iterative fashion, that's our adversarial imitation from observation approach. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the, some, I'll give a qualitative example of some of the results. So this is a, a video we recorded of an expert. So we trained an expert agent in this domain using reinforcement learning and a lot of time. Um, and then we were able to collect this video visual demonstration from the, from the simulator. And then um, we provide that to our algorithm, this adversarial imitation from observation approach. And so this is how the policy evolves over time. So at first, uh, we, don't, we don't get great behavior, but we're still training our networks. As we make it more and more through the training procedure, um, we see that the, the imitator is trying, is getting closer and closer to what the, what the demonstration looks like. And then in the end, you can see that the, uh, the learn policy is basically indistinguishable from the uh, demonstrative policy. And uh, you can see that uh, this is all done using just a visual uh, demonstration, no action information. So it seems that uh, deep neural networks can indeed uh, help enable this kind of learning. So that wraps up um, the uh, observational extension of LFD that we've been working on at, at UT and at our Urban Research Lab. Um, I think I'll, I, can, I can leave you now with uh, maybe some teasers of, of other things we have going on in the lab. So like I mentioned, we have been extending some of that imitation from observation work to uh, real robot arms. Here's, a, here's some early videos of some of the uh, successful, uh, successful learning that we've had where where this is a pouring task using a UR5 robot arm. Um, we've also been sort of uh, considering the same problem when the demonstrating agent, the other agent is actually an agent that was trained in simulation. And uh, we, we look at trying to transfer that behavior to agents in the real world. And we've been looking at the sim to real transfer problem on these uh, soccer playing now robots. And then we also have some other work that's sort of uh, very much in the interactive learning uh, paradigm um, based on the, the Tamer work. Uh, learning from human feedback. This is still in sort of high dimensional simulators, um, though we do have plans to try to deploy it on, on some robots once this learning from demonstration work yields some good behaviors. So uh, on behalf of Peter and myself, thanks very much again for uh, inviting us to give a talk and uh, feel free to contact us um, with any questions or the, or the students who are involved in, in doing much of the work. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't be there for the question and answer period. Um, my wife is giving birth <laughs> exactly during the workshop. So um, Peter has agreed to be online for the question and answer period. And I think he'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs>